so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I believe the Lord wants to do something different tonight. Um, I believe it's just a continuation of All Day Sunday, and um, just excited about what God is. God is doing something so revolutionary in the church. He is awakening the church. He's He's alerting the church of His soon coming, um, and it's happening all over the place. In fact, I was talking to a good uh, friend of mine uh, out east. Um, he pastors in New Brunswick, and uh, I was chatting with him today. And he brought this up. He said, the spirit of Antioch. And I went, did you, like, did you go online and listen to Sunday night? Is that why you're talking about this? But he had a minister in his church on Monday night teaching discipleship. And that minister was talking about the spirit of Antioch and how it was important to disciple people and send them out. And I thought, Phew, we're on the right track. Amen. You don't have to stand today. I, I have many scriptures. My title tonight is, Is There Not a Cause? Is There Not a Cause? Starting in 1 Samuel 16 and 13. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, talking about David, the stripling, the between 14 and 16 year old young man. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, and if you remember Sunday morning, it might look bleak, and it might look like there is no hope in your situation, but when the Spirit of the Lord is in movement, anything can happen. It can change and rewrite your story forever. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, but the Spirit of the Lord, isn't that interesting, departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You know what this tells me? You have to be careful with the spirit of the Lord in your life. There's actually a scripture in the book of Psalms that says, the Lord desired to give ministry or, or, or um, prestige and honor to the houses, I believe it was Ephraim and Joseph, but they wouldn't do what God desired. And so God chose another house to do what he desired. And so what I want to submit to you tonight is be careful what you do with the Spirit of the Lord in your life. Don't treat it carelessly. Next verse. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play well with his hand, and you shall be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. Now, watch this very carefully. He is cunning in playing. He's a mighty, valiant man a man of war, prudent in matters, good-looking, and the Lord is with him. David could be 15 years old, and all he does is tend the sheep in the wilderness. And his own family didn't want to invite him to the party Samuel had for them to anoint a new king. Oh, I've got another kid in the field, but he's not important. He's just tending the sheep. He's, he's only a stripling. He's only 14, 15, 16 tops. He could possibly be king. His own family lightly esteemed him. And yet in the king's palace, 
a servant of the king says, King, I've, just, I've got just the guy. Cunning and playing, a mighty, valiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters and comely person, and the Lord is with him. How many 14 and 15-year-olds could we say, yep, that's them? A man of war at 15. Wow. A man of video games, maybe. <laughs> or hero clicks or something. Can I tell you, when man exalts you, man can take you down. But when Jehovah exalts you, when the Lord Jesus exalts you, no man is ever going to take you down. Even though his family lightly esteemed him, the king's palace heard about the little stripling David, who was a mighty man of valor and a man of war. It's amazing to me, how do we know that David is between probably 14 and 16 years old? Because he has eight brothers. And three of them are at war in just a little bit. And you have to be 20 to go to war. And he's the youngest. So that means that there are three brothers still that are not of age to go to war that are older than him. So literally, he's between 14, 15, and 16 years old. And the king's palace is talking about this lowly shepherd boy who his family doesn't even notice or regard as a man of war, cunning and wise and all these things. Verse 19, wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him and Saul loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David, I pray thee, stand before me for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Up to this point, David's only job was to tend sheep. He had no other responsibility to tend sheep except to tend sheep. Be careful in the time of waiting that you just don't do the minimal. When Saul's servant talks about David, he's a valiant man, he's a man of war, he's, he's great, he's a great heart player. He doesn't say heart, but he's a great player. In the time of waiting, David just didn't sit back. He began to do other things. He, well, he fought off a lion and a bear, and he sang unto the Lord, and he learned an instrument. And it's, it's, it's important in your times of waiting, your times of wilderness, and in your times of crushing or process that you don't just sit back and say, God, get me out of this. There's purpose in the wait. 1 Samuel 17, 23, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath. This is David now goes to his brothers during the battle to give them pledge and to give them food. Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. So David is not old enough to be in the army. He's not old enough to fight. His family doesn't recognize anything about him. And so David by chance, is there when Goliath comes out to battle. And verse 24 says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should divide the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why? Comest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? What you do is not really important, David, and you're just meddling in stuff you don't understand, and you're not old enough to get. 
I don't care who Samuel thinks you are. You're a nobody. Anybody ever feel like a nobody? I know your pride and your naughtiness of your heart. Wow. Let me give you a little clue. When people come at you and say, you got a pride problem, you got an anger problem, you got a this problem, you got a that problem, it might be coming from them. They might have the issue. They're just trying to stick it to you. Eliab knew the hand of the Lord was on David and that God had anointed him king. He was there in the process when Samuel anointed David right in front of his whole family. And Eliab still says, you're prideful. You got a naughty heart. And why don't you just go tend your little sheep, boy? Eliab responded to David as an upstart and somebody that was in the way. See, when people don't look at you like you're anybody, it doesn't matter to God. His family didn't esteem him. His brother thought he was a nuisance. Uh, after he kills Goliath, Saul doesn't even know who he is. Isn't that amazing? He's the guy that plays the harp for Saul, gets rid of the evil spirit, and in the last set of verses, Saul said, I love David. Saul only loved David for what he could do for him. He didn't know David. He was just using his stuff. Can I tell you, it doesn't matter if people lightly esteem you. If the king knows you, if Jesus knows you, they might look on the outside. They might say, he's just a stripling. He doesn't have any experience. He can't do anything for God. But the Lord says, I've seen your heart. I saw you tending to sheep in the wilderness, playing unto me. When nobody saw, God sees the heart. When God begins to do the supernatural amongst us with people that we see as inexperienced or people that we see as not worthy yet or we see them as striplings, Saul, the King Saul said that about David. Who is this stripling? Who is this runt? Who is this kid? He was literally 14 or 15 years old, and you've heard me say this before. During the Azusa Street Revival, some of the great miracles that transpired in that place happened at the hands of 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. It doesn't matter what we think of you. It matters what he thinks of you. And too often we go around, walking around, going, if I don't have so-and-so's validation, God can't use me. But can I tell you, when David had his heart right, God positioned it perfectly for him to come to give pledge to his brothers when Goliath was coming to battle. It was the perfect time. If he had come an hour later, it was too late. In this end time harvest, God is going to confound the wisdom of men on who he will use for his purpose. Don't be surprised when the striplings in this house go far beyond anything we could ever do. Don't be surprised. Don't put on your Eliab glasses and say, you're too young. You're not experienced enough. You're not. I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but when Barack Obama was in the primaries against Hillary Clinton, I heard on some news site, it was this. The Clintons really thought that Obama should just wait his turn. It was Hillary's time to shine. And I can't help but think that that's exactly what Jesse's boys might have thought about the stripling David. We're grown. We're, we're going to battle. It's our time to shine, David. You wait your turn. God says, I just need someone with the heart that desires me so I can do something supernatural. Let me back it up just a minute. David's life was supernatural. What other 14-year-old is a man of war and valiant and cunning? How many 14, if anybody knows a 14-year-old who's a man of war and a valiant man and cunning with a harp, just let me know we're going to get him here. We'll put him right up on the platform. So he can be an example to all of us. Verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? 
What? David was just trying to, anybody ever feel like that? You're just trying to keep your heart right and live for God, and people are just shooting darts. David was used to this type of treatment. People may accuse you of being radical, and you need to slow down, or you need to wait your turn, but the Lord did something absolutely supernatural with David because he said, I need a man after my own heart. You know when I think, when I think it happened? I think it happened when the spirit of the Lord was upon him. I think it happened when the spirit of the Lord moved upon David. I'm telling you what, if you can get full of the spirit of the Lord, God can use you to do things you never thought possible. And I talked about that young man, Matt Yeeter, on Sunday morning, the missionary to Israel, who was the methadone, methamphetamines manufacturer And now he's blind because the chemicals sprayed up in his face. But God got a hold of that man. And he's now taken that man and his wife to Israel where they've started four preaching points. Was it Matt Yeeter that did it? No, no, no. It was the spirit of the Lord in Matt Yeeter's life that did it. And I'm telling you, you might be looking at this old shell of a person in the mirror every morning and you're saying, what could I possibly do for God? But if you can just get full of the spirit of God in your... There's no telling. Well, young people are clapping. That's why it's so important when you're teaching a Bible study, when you're reaching people, when you're talking to people, when you're imparting into people's lives, please do not look at them where they are right now. Please. Wow, they're a mess. Charles Mahaney, who was in gangs, I think think the process for initiation was they would... just making sure who the children are tonight. (laughs) They would stab you in the armpits as initiation. That was brutal. He was a mess. And yet he came to God and was a great witness of the Lord and preached all over the world. And his son Nick was backslidden. And one night the Lord woke up Brother Mahaney at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and he said, I want you to drive to this abandoned house in the city somewhere, and so Brother Mahaney got up in the middle of the night and found his son wrapped up in rope in that abandoned house, beaten half to death, and he would have lost his life if his father hadn't come. And Nick Mahaney was looking at at least 20 to 25 years in jail at one point, and the Lord delivered him. Now Nick Mahaney is a preacher of the gospel, and he preaches all over the world. If you can just get the spirit of the Lord in you. And I'm not talking just a little emotionalism on Sunday. I'm not talking just a tiny bit just to get you to Wednesday. Oh, I hope to God pastor has something good Wednesday. I'm talking about living in the overflow like T.W. Barnes where you're praying every day and you're waiting for God to show you what he desires you to do in the day. Verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, what am I? Am I a dog that you, you bring me this? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give the flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. Watch. When you set your mind on doing something for God, the enemy will always come at you with fear and intimidation. You can't do it. I am going to destroy you. You won't survive this. You, and you know what? Goliath had a point. He was big. He was bad. He was experienced. He had sword. He had shield. He had armor. He had a helmet. David was 14 or 15 years old, and all he did was 10 sheep. He was a nobody even in his family. But watch 
David's response. This is so key. When you step out and begin to do a work for God and the enemy rewinds you what you don't have. You don't have the weapons. You don't have the experience. You don't have the smarts. You don't have the personality. You will never do a work here. I will destroy you. Then David says to the Philistine, you come at me with a sword and a spear and with a shield, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come in the name of Jesus. You see, you're coming out with me with all you have, but all I need is Jesus. All I need is the name above every name. I might be a stripling and I might not have any experience and I might be a nobody in everybody's sight, but I'm telling you, I got the name. I'm telling you, I'm filled with the Spirit of God. Woo! If we could just get a revelation of how powerful the Spirit of God is in our lives when we allow it to work day to day to day. I remember Brother Eli Hernandez, I was reading his book. I'm hooked on Eli. He said... There was a woman, he was at a conference in California. A woman came to the conference. She was in the Starbucks lineup. And some, somebody was behind her. And she just felt a nudge in the Holy Ghost. Ask him, ask him if he knows the Lord. And she's, okay. So she turns around. She says, do, do you know the Lord? He goes, well, yes, I do. Would you like to come to my church? Sure. That was easy. See, that's why we go to Starbucks. It's just write the proofs in the pudding, people. Let the Lord use you. <laughs> oh, it's a church split. <laughs> After you going to Tim, Tim Horton's church. He came to church, I believe it was that night, and he heard preaching about baptism in Jesus' name. And he was sitting next to the pastor, behind the pastor, and the pastor didn't know who he was. And he said, how come I have never heard this teaching? He said, I am in charge of 20,000 ministers in Africa, and I have to go back and teach them this. Would you baptize me in Jesus' name? She wasn't a licensed minister. She didn't preach all around the world. She was just going through the lineup at a coffee shop. You come at me, enemy, with what you have, but I come at you in the name of, I just feel bold in the Holy Ghost. If somebody would just recognize who Jesus is in you, when the enemy comes against you in fear and intimidation, oh, you shut up, devil. I got the Holy Ghost in me. You better be scared. So you know what David does? He's not apprehensive of Goliath. He is so bold in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he runs towards the enemy. Woo! This 10 foot tall giant of a man with all the weapons. And David just has a few stones. And he's only a boy. That is the boldness that the Lord desires us to have, to look at the mountains in front of us and say, it doesn't matter about the mountain because I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. You would defy the armies of God, but I come to you in the name of Jesus. You are not going to stop this church. You are not going to stop what we're trying to do. The enemy brought intimidation and tempted fear into the heart of David. And David brought what he had practiced in his time of waiting with the sheep. That's why in the wilderness of your life, it's important to read the word of God. It's important to pray. It's important to dig in because God is always preparing you in the wilderness. If you're never prepared in the wilderness, God never brings you out of the wilderness. There, there's some encouragement. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose, came draw, draw nigh to meet David. Anyway, David killed him. You know that story. First Samuel 18 and 1. This is after. And they're uh, talking to, uh, David's talking to Jonathan, Saul's son. 
And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan, watch, stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. Saul sent him over the men of war. What? You're 15 years old, and you're over the armies of Israel. Don't underestimate what God can do with a submitted vessel that's full of the Holy Ghost. David was still a teenager when he was sent out, and everything he did was wise. That's why Saul was jealous. And he was over the armies of Israel. And Jonathan literally takes off his identity and gives it to David, signifying that, David, you're the heir, not me. Gives David everything that Jonathan did have. I just pray somebody gets understanding tonight. If you can get full of the Holy Ghost, if you can get full to overflowing of the Lord Jesus Christ in you, I don't care what Goliath stands in your way. I don't care what calling you think God has in your life because if you have the Lord Jesus activated in your life, you can literally do anything. In the last days, We have to be careful we don't try to suppress the Davids among us. It was nothing short of incredibly supernatural. You see in the parables, the Lord says, the Lord of the harvest, he gets people to start in the harvest at the beginning of the day. And then at the last hour of the day, he also brings in people and pays them the same amount of money. And people that start at the beginning of the day become angry. Why are you giving them the same reward? We've worked all this time, and this guy just showed up six months ago. And now you're letting him preach? Now you're letting him do this? And the Lord said, have I not made a deal with you? Is this not okay? I'm telling you, the stu- my wife was telling me about youth camp, and she said, the young preachers that are there, they are flowing in the Spirit. I don't know if it was during preaching or at the altar call. One preacher would take the microphone. This is what I feel we need to do right now. Boom. The other preacher would take the microphone and say, okay, here's what's happening right now. There is a flow. People are working with the Lord. And God is confirming the word with signs following. Let's not get jealous of people that are going to be used in great ways. Jesus wasn't. The things that I do. Greater things will you do. Sister Wendy, stop yawning at my preaching. I love you. From a lowly shepherd boy who was lightly esteemed, from his own family to a few short months to years later, he's in charge of the army of Israel and he's marrying the king's daughter. Think about that. In perhaps a two-year span, he's tending sheep out in a field singing songs unto the Lord, fighting off lions and bears. And just by chance, he kills Goliath. And two years later, he's in charge of the army. And he's now the king's son-in-law. Because when you can get full of the Holy Ghost, God can divinely position... You can't figure out the angle and you can't figure out the perspective, but if you could just submit to the process, uh, God can exalt you in due season and use you in great and wonderful ways. And my question to you tonight is, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? We need a spirit of David in this day that says it doesn't matter what the challenge looks like ahead because I have the Lord of hosts in me. It doesn't matter what the enemy's coming at me with. We need a spirit of David 
that came across the book of Acts church. A church that went from hiding from the Sanhedrin to preaching boldly in the streets and thanking God that they could be persecuted for his namesake. We need a spirit of David that was alive in Azusa Street. You know what happened in Azusa Street? And I've said these stories, but I don't get tired of saying these stories because I want you to remember them. One lady recalls she was about three years old and she remembered waking up from a nap during the middle of a service at Azusa Street. And she had a jar with her and she tried to catch the cloud with the jar. She tried to catch the glory of God that was in that room with a jar she had. Supernaturally, do you know what happened at Azusa Street? Is that people would go out from us. It was like an Antioch church. People would go out from Azusa Street, go to a foreign field, not able to understand or speak the language, and God would help them minister and reach those people. We need a spirit of David that pushed a young man and a young woman and a three-month-old baby to drive from Perth and over New Brunswick in mid-January to North Bay, Ontario when they were literally 20 to 21 years old to start a church. Oh, there was a building, but there was nobody in it. I think one person was in it. And then finally, after 13 years in North Bay, the spirit of David calls again and says, I need you to come to Peterborough. But things are going good in North Bay. We're up to 60 or 70 people now. Like things are starting to finally move. Yes, but I want you to go to Peterborough now. So they came to Peterborough and they lived, lived on credit for years because the church could not support them. We need a spirit of David that says, I don't care what's coming against me. If this is what God wants me to do, I'm running at it. Get out of my way, Goliath. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And the culture in the church in North America is mostly this. Come and be blessed. Come and receive Come and listen and get your fill. But I ask you tonight, is there not a cause? Ma, I'm sorry, this is not regular Wednesday night. I just got to be me. Who, who knows Mark Brown here? Some of you know Mark Brown. He was Mexican-American probably about 35 now, and um, he was saved in Chicago and um, went to one of the Bible colleges around there. And all of a sudden, this Mexican-American, dad, mom and dad, I think, came from Mexico. He felt a call to start a church in South Dakota. So he wanted to be in charge of... Not too many Mexican-Americans in South Dakota, I don't think. Didn't make any sense. People didn't understand what he was trying to do. Mark, you got, you got a future, man. Why are you doing that? Why would you go there? Stay here. But he said, I, I just feel that that's where God wants me to go. And so he went to South Dakota. He yielded to the call. He became the youth president, and all of a sudden, he was just the right place at the right time, submitted to the Holy Ghost. Became the youth president, began to preach all over North America. That's how we know who Mark Brown is. But you know what the amazing thing is about Mark Brown? He's raised up a church in that city in South Dakota in 10 years. 70, 80 people, God bless them, with a, like a million and a half dollar building. They didn't have the money for it, Okay. But you know what Mark Brown has done today? He has resigned that church. He has trained up another pastor under his ministry. He's resigned the church. Him and his wife have now moved on to the next city and are starting a brand new work. Is there not a cause? 
Scott Grant, used to, born and raised in Ontario, felt a call to go to missions to the province of Quebec, La Belle Province. Un peu de français ce soir, OK? C'est beau. C'est fini, c'est tout. That's it. That's all I got. People made fun of him. And he went to Montreal, la ville de Montréal. And he began to build a work unto the Lord because he said, he doesn't know the language. He's in his mid-30s. He was already pastoring a church here. Things were good. Why would you go and do that? Because is there not a cause? Is there not a need that we need? I don't care what Goliath we face in the way. I'm going to run at the challenge. And so he goes to the city of Montreal. And guess what he does? He raises up a church of 50, 60, 70 people. And you know what he did after that? He trained up a pastor under him. He resigned the church and gave them a new pastor and went to Trois-Rivières, Quebec. And guess what he did there? He raised up another church of 60 or 70 people. And guess what he did? He trained up another pastor and gave that church to him. And now Brother Scott Grant is in Quebec City. And you know what that man is doing? He's starting all over again, raising up another church. Because he's looking at the Goliaths in his life. And he says, is there not a cause? I will go. Pastor Lawrence Chevrier, good friend of mine, raised in Pentecost, backslidden, angry. God got a hold of him. And him and his wife went to St. John's, Newfoundland. Hardly any work to speak of. And I can attest to you, one of the hardest spiritual climates in Canada to build a church. Many preachers have failed. But Lorne is very hard-headed. And I hope he watches this. (laughs) And they have been there now for over five years. And they have prayed and fasted and fought and prayed and fasted. And now they have a core of over 20 people. And their church on some Sundays has reached over 50 people. I'm telling you, he could have stayed where he was in New Brunswick and sat under some. But he said, I don't care what what Goliath is. I don't care what the Goliath is as long as I have the name of Jesus. I might not be as qualified as the rest of you, but as long as I have the Lord. Brother Mitch McQuinn, I'm almost done. I am short all the time. So I've got like so much overtime right now. You know what Brother Arnold used to do? He used to say, can I have five more minutes? Right? Four people would raise their hands. Five, 10, 15, 20. Thank you. Brother Mitch McQuinn, him and his wife came to the city of Sudbury about 15 years ago, assisted Brother Brown until Brother Brown's uh, sudden passing seven or eight years ago. All of a sudden, Brother Mitch was thrust into the role of pastor But in the last seven years, that church has doubled. I talked to him today. I said, bro, what do you need? He said, hold on. He said, bro, I was just crunching the numbers today. 275 people have walked through our door since January, and the follow-up is overwhelming. I don't know how to follow up there's so many people to follow up with is there not a cause is there not a burden I asked brother Chevrier what do you need brother Chevrier he said we have several people that need the Holy Ghost and we need a church building 
I have one more example for you. You may know him. His name is Brother Michael Duran. I think he came to our church for a few weeks. I texted Brother Michael Duran because him and his wife, Kayla, and their brand new baby are going to go start a work on Vancouver Island. They are leaving the safety of the church that they are in. And they're saying, is there not a cause? And I'm afraid in the North American church, you know what happens sometimes? We get comfortable coming Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and getting blessed and getting fed. And if we reach somebody once every few years, praise God. But I'm telling you, we need a spirit of David that says there's so much more to do. Here is a young man that's putting it all on the line. I said, what do you need, bro? He said, we're selling our house and trying to move there in the next couple of months. Prayer for the right place would be appreciated. Pray for our finances as we are trying to raise a budget. There's a large demographic of urban poor that are unchurched. We feel that the Spirit is leading us in this direction. And the Coast Salish indigenous community makes up a large portion of the population. Reaching them is the one of the largest challenges we face, but we also carry a great burden for them. Given the history of abuse, scandal, marginalization, they live quite insulated from outsiders. But the Spirit is well able. Not by my might, but by my Spirit. I'm not your pastor, but I have the heart of a pastor. Is there not a cause? We need some spirit of David people in this church that would say, I know I'm not experienced and I know I don't have everything down right, but I'm going to do a work for God. I will go. There are literally hundreds of cities in Ontario with no pastor. There are literally millions and millions of people in this province that have never heard the gospel. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand, Terry Marcus, could you come back? We're going to do three things tonight. We're going to have three areas of prayer up at the front. The first area of prayer is going to be for St. John's, Newfoundland and Sudbury, Ontario. The people that come up there, we are going to pray that God would bless them with people being filled with the Holy Ghost in St. John's, Newfoundland. They would find a building. And that brother Mitch McQuinn, he has, he's raising up leaders. But the people are coming in so fast that there's not enough leadership there to follow up. Pray that God gives him strength and God gives him supernatural ability to raise up those leaders or that someone would come to him. Those are the two churches we pray for there. Right here in the middle, I know where Sister Wendy's going. Right here in the middle, we're going to pray for Brother Michael and Kayla Durand. I have a tremendous amount of respect, especially in this culture when it's all about money and materialism and buying a house and going on a vacation, right? Michael has literally said, I will forsake all of it and I will just go build a church even against his mother's wishes. I'm just kidding. I have a great amount of respect for people that will say, you can take my life, but give me Jesus. Remember those that saved their life. 
will lose it. But those that lose their life for his name's sake, the same shall save it. So Brother Michael Durand right here and over here. The Bible says, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38. Verse 37 says, Then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Why? Because they weren't willing. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And that could be down the street. It could be in Lakefield. It could be in Omimi. Or it could be halfway across the world. But over here, the people are going to pray, God, send labor, whether it's you or whether you're just praying for God to send laborers. And I've said this many, many, many times, that send forth means literally to push them out forcefully because the hour is late and the need is great. Is there not a cause Old Brother Kilgore in Texas, he raised up hundreds of ministers and sent them out for the gospel. So Sunday night we talked about being an Antioch church, and an Antioch church was a church that not only gave, but sent. And so how many times do we pray for our stuff? How many times do we pray for our needs? Tonight's altar call is not about us. It's about others. It's not about us. God fix this. God fix that. God make me happy. God make me content. God, send laborers in to the harvest. St. John's, Newfoundland, Sudbury, Ontario. Duncan, British Columbia, with Michael and Kayla Durand. And over here, we're praying God send forth labor. And don't if you need to travail, if you need to intercede, come on, God is looking for people to stand in the gap. Hallelujah. With those three things in mind, would you come right now and let us begin to pray? Oh, Jesus. Begin to pray as the Spirit begins to lead you. For St. John's, Newfoundland, for people to be filled with the Holy Ghost, for strength and discipleship in Sudbury, for Michael and Kayla Duran that are raising up a church in Duncan, B.C. Hallelujah. And for over here, God, I will go. God, I will go. I will do a work. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Come on, let us begin to be that Antioch church that begins to travail in prayer, that begins to intercede for the lost and stand in the gap. Oh, Jesus. a They're not a cause. Give me a burden. Oh, Jesus.
Stop looking at your ability and begin to look at the supernatural ability that the Spirit of the Lord gives you just like he gave David. churches know we're we're praying for them right now and they really appreciate it. They're so thankful that Peterborough's praying for them right now. Prevail. Begin to stand in the gap. Hallelujah. This is the church in action right now. Is there not a God? Come on, David, you're stronger than you think. Hallelujah. The Lord is with you as you pray. The Lord is with you as you pray. Go boldly. Go boldly into prayer because he's with you.
Ramasotore Bacoma. 